Uh, we were talking about essentially the spirit world. And um, I, what I tried to prove to you last time is that there is a spirit world. So uh, we're going to continue down that. Um, We're going to continue down that road, and today we're going to cover a little bit about angels. So if you're familiar with this subject, you know there's so much. You could probably, you, I could cover this thing for six months on angels and the spirit world. And so it's, we're going to focus on a couple things. But, you know, a lot of things in the Bible, folks, was, they, they read it, they hear what's in the Bible, and they think it's just a fable. You know, and this, this is one of the subjects right here. You know, you know, people are more apt to believe in ghosts than they are angels. You know, or they have groups that pray to angels. I mean, they take it too far. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Bible talks about, uh, there's fire-breathing dragons in the Bible. You know, the devil, he's a fire-breathing dragon. Do you know that? There's unicorns in the Bible. There's talking serpents. Uh, there's unseen angelic armies. And uh, for those that don't just have the New Testament, you guys just have the New Testament, but go to uh, 2 Kings 6, and let's look at uh, verse 13. I'll read it for you. 6, 13. And what we have here is we have the Syrian army and we have it surrounding uh, Elisha and his servant here. And in verse 13 it says, And he said, Go and spy where, uh, where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses, chariots, and great hosts. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host uh, compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, so this guy's freaking out, this Elijah's servant. He's like, alas, my master, how shall we do? Like, what is the common vernacular? Like, ah! <laughs> you know? And then verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. What did he see? It says, And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down uh, to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord, and he said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. That's a nice positive prayer to pray, huh? Real nice guy, huh? Blind them all, God. You know, and God answered his prayer, of course. And, uh, and when he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. So it's, the point is, uh, his servant didn't have this perception to see what was really going on. And that's going to be your lot in life most of the time. You, you don't understand, even, even in this room right now, there's a spiritual war going on. You know, uh, maybe you brought something with you today, you know, that you can't see. Hopefully it's something good, you know, but... but uh, Maybe not, you know, and uh, we don't know what happened in this room before we came in here, you know. Is anyone praying about that? Maybe we should be praying about that a little more, like, Lord, clean this place out. We, we just want to hear from your Holy Spirit today. We don't want no sick, unclean spirits, you know, when we bow our head in prayer to say, you know, remind you how hungry you are and all the stuff you got to do when you leave here, you know, and that's going to be a big thing about trying to hear God is the preparation. When you come to church, you don't then start praying. It's, did you pray before you came here? Did you try to get ready to get ready kind of thing? But um, when reading the Bible about these heavenly celestial creatures, you're going to find cherubim, seraphims, archangels, angels, and the Bible uh, speaks very matter-of-fact about all of it. It doesn't say, well, I know this might be a little weird sounding, but it just talks very matter-of-fact about it. Like, Lord opened his eyes, and he saw all these chariots of fire. It's an angelic army, even bigger than the Assyrian army there. So today we're going to look at angels because it's needed. You know, whole cults have been started on seeing an angel. Whole cults. 
You know, uh, the, the Mormon church uh, got started because some angel named Moroni, or Moron I. <laughs> what is in a name, right? I mean, couldn't you pick a better name than that? But I guess Joseph Smith went with it. He thought he was cool with it. You know, he came from a witchcraft family. You can research that on your own. But uh, uh, um, also, I um, believe Muhammad, he, he saw an angel as well. You know, the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. So you got to know about angels. you got to do a little bit of research. Because uh, if something just appears, you're not supposed to just believe everything this something says. Or else you might be the next cult leader, all right? Um, let's go to Galatians chapter 1 on that note. Galatians 1, that will be in your New Testament. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, look at this, or an angel, huh? Or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Even an angel? As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So Paul's telling you, I mean, even before Joseph Smith ever saw it, he warned Joseph Smith. Guess what, Joey? <laughs> yeah, guess what? An angel might show up one day and preach something different than this to you. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. But apparently Joseph Smith wasn't much on reading the Bible. Um, he was more about using his little seer stone. Check that out on your own. What's that? That's uh, extracurricular. That's all you. But today I want to look at uh, specifically, let's look at Michael first. Michael. Michael. What's that mean? Michael means, who is like unto God? Anybody named Michael in here? No? Pretty common name, isn't it? And uh, Michael, we find, is called an archangel. So, archangel is apparently a little higher than a normal angel. Uh, go to Jude verse 9. That'll be in the back. Somebody got that? Jude 9? Go ahead and read it nice and loud, please. Oh, Jude, it says, uh, yet Michael, Jude verse 9. Right. All right, so we find there he's called an archangel. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4.16... It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from uh, heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But essentially, Jude 9, this is going to be your only text right here where you find an archangel. Now, in, in Catholic, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's a bunch of archangels. Uh, in uh, the book of Enoch, in... Uh, or the Apocrypha, which is in the Catholic Bible. <laughs> they got a bunch of these things. But in your King James Bible, that's it. That's it. Now, uh, let me show you something in a second here about that. But go to Ephesians 1.21. 
And I just want to show you that God is a God of order. Amen? God is a God of order in the church. He's a God of order in your household. He's a God of order in government. He's a God of order even in heaven. All right, and in Ephesians 1, uh, what is it, verse 22? Yeah, 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion uh, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So he's giving you, he, what he's telling you is in that spiritual realm, there's ranks. There's principalities and powers. And there's a ranking system on God's side and even on the devil's side. He has a ranking system as well. And uh, those who have been going to our institute, I've shown you, sometimes you can see the devil is attempted to mirror God. The devil is attempted to be God. Obviously, in Isaiah 14, he said, I shall be like the Most High, which he found out that he couldn't real quick, but he's still going down with the ship, and he's trying to be anti-God. So, you know, Satan has a son. Satan has a bride. You know, uh, Jesus' bride is the church. Who's Satan's bride? Anybody? Hmm? The whore. The whore of Babylon. That's his bride. Yeah, essentially the Catholic church. I, I think it's a lot bigger, but, I mean, yeah, that fits. That fits. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. I mean, you can read all that through uh, Revelation 19. But uh, uh, in Colossians, let's go over there. Hang a right. Uh, Colossians 1.16. And it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And verse 17, And he's before all things. And by him all things consist. I mean, you could just keep reading this. And he is the head of the body. See, he's the head of it all. So, AKA, if you're on Jesus' side, you're on the winning side. And if you're not, you're not. And uh, that's, not, that's not very, uh, I don't know, politically correct, but it's true. Wouldn't you rather know the truth? I'd rather know the truth. I don't care what's politically correct. Just. Waist high over the plate, please. You know, just tell me. I, I could deal with it on my own, you know. But uh, there's this hierarchy. Uh, go over to 1 Peter 3. You know, all roads do not lead to heaven. Santa Claus is not real. The Easter Bunny, he comes down the, ch the chimney. And Santa Claus comes hopping down the bunny trail. We're in 1 Peter 3.22. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto Him. Everything is subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you say, well, why doesn't He just stop all the bad in this world then? Because He lets you have your own free will. That's why. He wants you to choose Him with your own free will. He's not going to force you. I mean, he shed his blood for you. Don't you think that's pretty good? Uh, I always thought it's interesting in John 3.16, it said, for God so loved the world. Past tense. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave, past tense, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, present tense, everlasting life. So God, He doesn't sit up there and love every drunk, wife-beating heroin addict. He's not up there and just gushing with love and, and like how all these churches want to make it sound. Like, oh, He's just consumed with you. No, He's not. God is angry with the wicked every day. That's what the Bible says. And He exercised an act of love 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ hung on that cross. For who? 
You. Well, but I'm wicked. Then you qualify. Christ died for sinners. If you're not a sinner, then he didn't die for you. See how that works? See, a lot of people, they want to act like they have no sin, don't they? Okay, then Christ didn't die for you. Move on. Oh, oh, no, I, I want to be okay with him too. Well, you got to be a sinner to be okay with him. You got to bow the knee and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I'm headed to hell without what you did for me. And unless you come to that point, you're still headed for hell. But that's not God's will. Why would he send Jesus to die for you? Why would he do it? That's obviously not his will. But he's not up there gushing with love about your drug problem or about what you're doing on the weekend or whatever you did last summer. You know, I mean, he's not happy with that stuff. He has to judge it. Uh... You don't get too many amens talking like that, but <laughs> Amen. Man, that that encourages me. <laughs> Romans six twenty three says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a wage that comes with that sin. There's a paycheck. Raise your hand if you've ever had to taste that paycheck. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and once you've committed that act, there's no going back. You've got to pay. But, you know, uh, evangelist Jim White, Pastor Yancey's best friend, um, before he passed, he, he preached a message. He said, you know, uh, oh, what is it? It's in Galatians 6, 7. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's what it says. And he said, guys, it's okay to pray for crop failure. Think about it. The, the decisions you made in this life, have you really got everything that you planted back and more? I think God has blessed us with some crop failure. Thank you, Jesus. But guess what? Some of the stuff, it still comes up. You know? And around the dinner table, and maybe at a family gathering or in the middle of a church service, it still comes up. And you're like, man, why did I have to do that back then? Uh, you're reaping it. You're reaping it, you know? Somebody woke up in jail today, and you know what was in their mind? Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I've done some preaching in the prison, and what's sad is those guys get close to God real quick. I mean, it's, an, it's a blessing. I mean, I'm happy for them in that sense, but it's sad that now that they want to serve God, where do they wake up? In a prison cell. That's it. And they're just doing their time, you know? But, um, all right, now, it's common, like I said, when people are researching angels, um, they go outside of the Bible, which you've got to understand, once you go outside of this book, you're in no man's land. You're safe right here. And, you know, we joke about it, but they say, oh, you're narrow-minded. Yeah, I'm this narrow-minded right here. Just from, from here to here. Because the thing is, when you're going to these other documents, you don't have the guarantee that you're getting the truth. Um, look at, uh, I think it's Matthew 4.4. 4. Matthew 4.4. 4. And bear with me, I know we're jumping around a bit. It's more of a Bible study today. But Jesus, when he's in the wilderness being tempted by the devil... That get anyone's attention? I mean, don't you think that'd be a good time to listen up to Jesus? How does he deal with that? I mean, we're talking about angels, demons, spiritual principalities, powers, the devil himself. He's now tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus answers him in verse 4, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Some of you are starving to death this morning. You haven't eaten weeks or years. You don't feed yourself spiritually. You feed yourself physically, not spiritually. You're starving. And, you know, a lot of times in this world we wonder, why do I have these problems? You know, maybe I should go get some medications. It's just, how about God? What about the great physician? 
Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for medications, but a lot of times that's not the issue. A lot of times the side effects, you got to research it all yourself. A lot of times the side effects are a lot worse than the uh, initial problem. I mean, was that like the Menendez brothers or something? I don't know, man. But, I mean, you see a lot of junk. These people are on psych meds. So you got to watch it. Because remember, you're going to go down that road, you're going to reap it. You're going to reap it. Now, um, there's angelic representatives. Go to uh, Daniel 10. Daniel chapter 10. All right, and let's look at verse 18 through 21. It says, Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man. Notice that. And he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. He's talking to Daniel. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then he said, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I'm, uh, when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia will come. We're going to verse 21. But I will show thee uh, that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. So we find with these angelic representatives, you're finding a bunch right there. You got the prince of Persia. You got the prince of Grecia. You got Michael, your prince. What's going on? We're talking about angelic powers, authorities. We're talking about spiritual things that, you know what? You're not going to see it more than likely. But I'll tell you, man, there's whole Pentecostal churches that are dedicated to praying that God would bring down that spiritual veil. Which I would tell you, that's a horrible prayer to pray. God put that thing there for a reason. And uh, sometimes the worst thing you could do is get your prayers answered. <laughs> you would just think, I mean, would you sleep at night if you really saw like what the devil looked like? I mean, and how easily he can go through walls, and I mean, how many demons and devils there, the Bible says devils that there really are? You think you'd sleep at night? Watching them go around your children at night? I mean, walk up and down your hallway? What a stupid prayer. How stupid. You know, I mean, I think it's just better to just pray with your kid, your wife, and just say, Lord, we don't know what's out there, but please protect us. And we're just going to trust you that if we wake up tomorrow, thank God it's a miracle, let me sleep. <laughs> <laughs> please I mean uh, so I, when, when I used to go see those horror movies I still have like crazy like when the lights are off I'm, I'm thinking about these stupid movies I used to watch I'm like it's still with me you know you let it in and it's real this stuff there's something going on that God wants to keep your eyes from seeing it. Uh, you know, Michael, like what we see there, Michael is a representative of where? Does anybody know? Israel. He's a representative of Israel. Uh, let's read one verse and I'll give you the other ones. Uh, Revelation 12, 7. Let's go there. Revelation 12, 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. That didn't really give you the thing. Let's do another one. Uh, Daniel 10, 13, right where we were. Randy, I was just there. Well, go back. You're going to get a paper cut. 
Daniel 10, 13. And it says this, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there uh, with the kings of Persia. And then we already read verse 21. It says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. He's the prince of the Jews, Israel. Um, you could always reference Daniel 12.1 too. 12.1 also. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Who's that? Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since was a nation, even unto the same time. And that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. That's referencing Revelation 20. So Michael, he's also a warrior. In uh, Revelation 12, where we were, uh, 7 through 8, and we see he's getting in war with the devil himself. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. He's got angels too. Did you know that? Now you understand why you don't want to listen to every angel? He'll have one show up on you. And verse 8, it says, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon, verse 9, was cast out. So effectively, I guess Michael's pretty good at his job. Amen? <laughs> Whose side is Michael on? God or the devil? God's side. Which side are you on? That's a good question. And Michael, we already talked about it, um, he's the only archangel, but he's only one of the chief princes. That's what's weird. He's only one of the chief princes. Um, but what are you going to do? Are you going to run with what the book says or what, what it doesn't say? Those of you that are in our institute, I try to show you, if there's 50 clear verses on, on a subject, do you go with the one that's not clear? No. no. You go with the clear verses. And if something's not clear, then put it in the back file of your mind and read your Bible and pray, and maybe God will give you light on it. But guess what? We've got to stick with what's clear. So to our knowledge, he's... He's the only listed by name archangel. And uh, here's, here's one that folks make a mistake on, is Gabriel. Gabriel. And Gabriel means champion or hero from God. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Gabriel. And in Luke 1.19, what you're going to find here, it says, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee and show thee these glad tidings. So in Luke 1.19, you see that Gabriel, he stands before God. But what Dr. Ruckman always showed, which I, th I think has helped me to kind of remember about Gabriel, he has the gift of what? <laughs> the gift of gab. He always has a message. He's got something to say. Michael's a warrior. Gabriel, he wants to tell you something. So we're in um, Luke 1. Look at 11 through 13. And it says, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. 
But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Let's talk about John the Baptist. So he shows up and he's got a message. Guess what? You're about to see a miracle around here. And um, it says right there in verse 12, and fear fell upon him. See that? Could you imagine if something just appeared in this room? It was like, A.V. King James Baptist Church, I have a message for you. We'd be like, whoa! Whoa! But, you know, you got to try the spirits. It's like, All right, what's the message? Chapter and verse, <laughs> you know? We're going to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And it's kind of like, okay, well, I'll see if my wife starts showing, buddy. Okay. I heard the message. We'll see. Sure enough, John shows up. Look at uh, Luke 1, 26 through 31, six months later. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel shows up again, was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Starting to sound familiar, isn't it? To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art that, I'm sorry, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind of what manner of salutation this should be. She was troubled in her mind. Why? How would you feel? <laughs> what? You just appeared in my house. Who are you? What, what is all this? Verse 30, and the angel said unto her, remember he has a message, fear not. See, when you come into the Bible, you know, a lot of people, they hate, they hate the Word of God. But you, you got to admit, man, if this wasn't written by God, it sure makes a fool out of God's people a lot, doesn't it? Like, you know, there's a whole religion that worships Mary. And right here, she looks like an idiot. She's fearing just an angel. I thought she's the co-redemptrix. I thought she's like number four to the Trinity. Right? That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. It is what they teach. She's afraid of an angel. Something's missing. It says, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So we see this angel showing up once again with a message. Now, um, Gabriel is not referred to anywhere in the Bible as an archangel. Where do you got to go to get that? The Apocrypha or the Book of Enoch or something. You're going outside of the Bible. So, remember, this, this is the safe place right here. You go anywhere outside this book, you know, you're no longer under the Lord's umbrella of protection. With what? With how you're perceiving the world, with how you're perceiving spirituality. You know, a lot of people, when they, when they... There's these ministries, and they think they're like spiritual warfare ministries. You know, and like the Asbury Revival, they think they're all about this. Me, me and Mary Chris saw this video, and this guy's eyes are like bulging out of his head, which is not a good sign, by the way. And, <laughs> and he's like, good news, there's devil manifestation at Asbury. And it's like, that's good news? And, I mean, you had to kind of conclude, what, what is he saying? He's saying that they're casting them out, okay? But look, look at the end of uh, Mark. Uh, go to Mark 16. Maybe you'll be interested in this. Let's, let's show you the fallacy of the Asbury Revival. Go to the last chapter of Mark, Mark 16. Mark 16, and look at verse 17. I'll write that here. Even though It's kind of a side note. Mark 16, 17, and it says this. Now, this is the verse that, that folks at that quote-unquote false revival are going to uh, show you. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, uh, shall they cast out devils. Okay? They shall speak with new tongues. That's what they shall do. They shall take up serpents, 
And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You see how it says shall, shall, shall? Do you see that? That means those individuals, whoever this is talking to, they're going to do all that, not just one. Okay? Like a lot of them, they'll take you to this verse and they'll say, see, speaking in tongues is biblical. And it says there, uh, they shall speak with new tongues. They'll say, see? But they didn't read the rest of it. No, it says uh, you're going to cast out devils. Let's go to Sierra Highway right now in Lancaster Boulevard, and there's a few guys that need your help right now. Oh, they, oh I could do that. Okay, you know what? Even better. Because you shall do that. You shall what? Speak with new tongues. Uh, you shall take up serpents. Actually, let's go the opposite way. Let's go to the poppy reserve and find us a Mojave green. And you can just pick it up, right? I mean, if, if that's really what you believe. Here. We don't even have to drive that far. We could just go in the kitchen. Okay, let's go in the kitchen. Let's look under the sink. Okay, and it says this in verse 18. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Okay? So what, what can we do? We're just going to fill just a cap, just a cap of Clorox bleach. Because that's what it said. Clorox bleach is deadly. Oh, I'm not asking you to drink the whole bottle. <laughs> just a cap full. Right? It's just... I wouldn't drink. It's deadly. But, you know, you're teaching that you can do all these. So just a cap full, okay? All right? Right down the spout. Why are you walking back? Why don't you want to drink it? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? See, because the people aren't that stupid. They know it's not real. Now, rewind the tape. Um, Go to Mark 16, verse 14. That's the verse you need. And it says this, Afterward, he, Jesus Christ, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Who's he talking to? The apostles. The, apostles. the eleven. Now, verse 15, and when he said unto them, who? The apostles, the eleven, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized uh, sh shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's how you know belief saves you. See that? But then it gives this list. Those are apostolic signs for the Jews. You can, you can reference uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22. The Jews require a sign. You ever, you ever wonder why Moses came with like the... One of his first signs was like that leprous hand. God said, hey, put your hand in your vest and pull it out. And it was leprous. He said, put it back in there. And then it was just like brand new baby skin. That was one of the signs. Why would he have to come with that? Because that's what the Jews look for. You, you think about uh, the Red Sea splitting. Why would he have to do that? Because the Jews weren't going to follow him if something like that wasn't happening. They needed the cloud by day. They needed the pillar of fire by night. They had to see something. The Jews, they follow the signs. Gentiles, have you heard everything that guy knows? Man, he knows so much. I'm going to buy more books, man. I'm going to know a lot too. You know, and that's Gentiles. Gentiles seek after wisdom. Jews need a sign. So isn't it interesting there, it says verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Signs. So these Jewish apostles are going out with signs. Because remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, he came first for who? The Gentile? He came first for the Jew. That's why Jesus Christ raised from the dead. You see? That's why Jesus Christ was healing the sick. That's why he was giving sight to the blind. On and on. Because he's like, look, guys, I'm here. I'm that prophet. And, but of course, he rocked the apple cart with the uh, Pharisees. He was messing up their money. So they had to get rid of that. But uh, I don't know if you folks are familiar with this fellow, but um, David Cloud, he's like an IFB guy, Independent Fundamental Baptist. Um, 
he references Gabriel as being an archangel. And I'm like, that's odd. And he even gives verses that have nothing to do with it. I'll read them. It's Daniel 8, 16, 9, 21, Luke 1, 19, and 26. And they all talk about Michael, but they don't say he's an archangel. So, I mean, you've got to stick with the Bible. Because a lot of folks, like none of us are uh, outside of this problem, or could be outside of this problem, but sometimes you just believe things because you've heard them. Like, you've got to prove the scriptures. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if you don't study the book, you're going to be ashamed. You're going to face God one day. He'll be like, wait, where'd you live? You'll say, America. Oh, man, did you have at least a, a fifth grade education? Yeah. And you were in America where the average house has a minimum of like three Bibles? Did you ever read one? No. That doesn't look very good for you, buddy. So angels, uh, I want to underline this here. Angels always appear as men. Because uh, you're used to seeing pictures, I'm sure, of angels, right? And a lot of times they're women, right? And they got wings, don't they? You know angels don't have wings? We're rocking the boat today, aren't we? Go to Hebrews 13, verse 2. Yeah, Hebrews 13, 2. It says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. What? Why? For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Wow. That means maybe walking down the street or walking by you in the grocery store. It might be an angel. What? I thought you said this is spiritual. Well, apparently, they can come around here. And that's, I would assume that's probably both sides. What about that? Because if God's angels could do it, fallen angels, been there, done that. But you can entertain these things unaware. You see how careful you got to be? Um, look at Luke 24, 1 through 5. And really, the only protection you have is the Word of God. That's it. That dusty old book that you don't want to read. If you're not in that book, I mean, you're really, you're hurting yourself. Luke 24, 1 through 5. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher. So this is after Jesus Christ was, uh, died and buried. Bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, uh, they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. See that? And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? That would be a good sermon title right there. But you look at that. They got afraid again. Were they afraid of wings? No. It was two women? No, it was men. There's no wings. They're men. You see how much tradition has crept into this? Um, go to Acts 1.10. You're just going to find the same thing. Hang a right. 
Go to Acts 1.10. Now this is after Jesus Christ. He ascends into heaven right in front of a bunch of his witnesses there. In Acts 1.10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye up gazing into heaven? Uh, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Man, they're always checking these guys, aren't they? Hey, what what are you standing there looking stupid for? Do something, right? But look, two men. These are angels. You don't see wings. You don't see women. These are angels. So uh, the old, old Schofield Bible, which is 90% good, he says that angels are sexless. I don't think I need to explain the difference between a man and a woman, but these were two men. You know what that goes back to? Genesis 6. Go to Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them. Verse 2, that the sons of God, which are angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and that they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120. Look at this, verse 4. What comes out of this relationship? There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty, became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So what do we see here? Notice that? Angels always appear as men. And what do we find here? They're walking around. Around you. You might not even notice it, but we know they're always men. And what do we find in Genesis 6? We see the sons of God, and what's the argument? It's the godly line of Seth. That's the argument. Well, if it's the godly line of Seth, why didn't, all the, why didn't they all make it onto the ark? They're so godly. Because it says here that all flesh had been corrupted. You'd have to go, I think that's in... Genesis, um, well, I mean, you see it all through chapter 7. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days, forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Why? Because all flesh was corrupted. This is like millions of people. Randy, you believe in Noah's flood? Really? What do you think the... Grand Canyon came from. Oh, well, it's millions and billions a year. Mm -hmm. You know what? (laughs) That's cute. But you know what's a trip is I went, we went to uh, years ago when me and Mary Chris first got married, uh, we went to Hawaii. And remember, all this stuff takes millions and billions of years. And they have like this continuous lava going, right? So like the whole south end of the big island is just a bunch of lava rock. You know there's plants growing out of it? I thought that takes millions and billions of years. No, that stuff probably wasn't even there like a year ago. And there's already plants growing out of it. Someone ain't being honest. Look at Job 1 and, and also Job 2, but we'll start in Job 1. What are we doing? We're chasing a phrase through the Bible. What are we doing? We're letting the Bible define its own uh, words. What's the word we're looking at? Sons of God. Because guess what? You're a son of God if you're born again. You're a child of the devil if you're not. But if you're born again, you're a son of God. So we had someone walk into our church when we were at Oxford Inn. They said, well, I'm a son of God. And I said, I agree. If you're saved, you are. Sure. But angels are sons of God. Well, where does it say that? Oh, Job 1, in verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, When comest thou? You see this? What is this? This is a spiritual meeting up in heaven. And Satan's there. And who? Sons of God? Who? New Testament Christians? 
in the book of Job. You guys know that Job is the oldest book in the Bible? It's not put in a chronological form. It's put in a premillennial form, though. But Job is the oldest book. That's the oldest document in your Bible, Job. So there's New Testament Christians apparently showing up in heaven with the devil. It doesn't make sense. Something's wrong. Look at chapter 2. Because maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I read it wrong. Chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So what are these sons of God? Well, these sons of God are angels. And I don't have my reference, but... Is it Ezekiel? Is it Ezekiel 28? Where the sons of God... Shouted for joy. Why did I just zonk on that? Is that Isaiah 14? I think I zonked on you. It is Isaiah? Okay. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that reference. All the sons are gathered for joy. Anyway. I'll get you the reference later. But we'll just say for short, sons of God are angels. All right? And in Genesis 6, what you, what you have is you have Star Wars. You got the reference? Oh, okay, it is Job. Job 38, thank you. 7. Go there. Thank you for that. Now here we have, uh, it says, let's find this. Go to verse 6, just so we can kind of see what's going on. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? So God is questioning Job now, because Job was getting down and asking God questions. And God's like, where were you when I created everything? That's the context. Then he's, he's explaining more in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together in all the, look at this. Sons of God shouted for joy. New Testament Christians? No. They're angels. So you go back to Genesis 6 now, and then you see, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and that they took them wives of all which they chose. In verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. You have half-breed, half-angel, half human being things giants like bigger than Goliath like real giants and every time they find the bones the Smithsonian Institute hides them isn't that interesting you, you can research that all the all you want but really you didn't have to go outside of this book Joshua talks about them all throughout the Bible David fought one of them all throughout the Bible you didn't have to go anywhere but this book and guess what? You know that there's giants in the land. It is kind of interesting, though, to hear in Afghanistan that a whole platoon was uh, apparently killed and eaten by something very large. And um, then another platoon went out to go see what happened to their friends. And one of them got speared, and the rest of them shot this thing in the head. I don't know. But all I know is I, I believe this book. I believe this book. So there's some things in this book. I mean, Hollywood doesn't have nothing on this. They're not coming out with any movies that blow this book out of the water. They're stealing from this book. So there's no sexless, sexless angels. Angels are also called the sons of God. And we looked at Genesis 6, Job 1, and Job 2. Angels. I didn't barely scratch the surface. We looked at Essentially, we just kind of looked at two. But you see how deep the thing just, just goes? What's the crux of it? There's, there's a spiritual warfare going on right now between angels and devils right now in this room, in Roseman, in California, in America, in this world. And there's, there's entities over countries. And... You know, we see that Michael, he's a representative of Israel, 
But, you know, it, it did make me wonder this morning. I was like, I wonder who the representative is over our country. I wonder how he's doing. This country seems like it's going down the, <laughs> going down the drain. You know, where, where uh, transvestites are uh, running the show now and teaching your children in the libraries and... And that's acceptable. And if you say something against that, well, you must be a hate monger. You know, and uh, Pastor Stevenson, he said it real good last night. He said, you know, you know why they hate this book? Because this, bo this book tells you black and white what it is, right or wrong, right or wrong, right or wrong. They got to get rid of this book. And I guess what we could say is the Roman Catholic Church already tried. They couldn't get rid of this book. So what'd they do? If you can't beat them, join them. They got in the Bible printing business. So they started making perverted versions. So we'll end with this verse. Go to Psalm 12, 6 and 7. That's a nice place to end. Nice positive note that the Word of God is not going to be broken. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. Let's go ahead and stand. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. And it says this, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. They thought burning all the people with their Bibles was going get to get rid of the book. And what did they find out? It just started spreading. So, you know what? They tried it. You know, if, you're, if your government wants to try it too, they can take a crack at it. But, you know, there hasn't been much success. You know, the, the, the body of Christ seems to flourish under persecution. So they think they're going to get rid of this book. You'd have to get rid of God to get rid of this book. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, let's get our hymn books. Let's open up to uh, page number 559. Page 559. And as you're turning there... Um, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I just ask that you guys take...